Thank you so much, everyone. What a warm welcome. Uh, did everyone sleep well last night? Sh show of hands, how many woke up by the thunder? <laughs> so we can all relate to each other already. Um, so uh, yesterday I was uh, talking a bit with, uh, with Jakub and he was asking what this presentation was about and I said it, I would try to do it in a funny way and he said it's not going to be funny for him uh, un unless if I do something about eating a banana and fall asleep on the banana peel or something. But uh, I couldn't find a banana this morning but it would have been very nice to just hear him laugh uh, for all of you. So instead I will just go with the original plan. Um, so I titled it Stop Bluffing and Start Relating and I think by the end of the presentation you will understand why hopefully, otherwise you can ask questions if I didn't succeed in explaining it. Um, just a bit about this, uh, whenever you give a presentation you have to have this credibility slide, why should you even listen to me? And uh, well I'm co-founder of Anima International, I'm director of campaigns and communications. I do have a master's degree, although I don't think that it's that important, but I put it on anyway. Um, I have 50 years of experience with this field. Um, in my work, I think I've roughly impacted about 100 companies to changing policies in various different uh, topics. It could be uh, cage-free, it could be broilers, it could be dolphinariums and uh, foie gras, and uh, you mentioned it. I've tried a few things and uh, I've appeared in hundreds of media stories. So. I do have some sort of success to back up the claims that I'm making. Um, so in this presentation I will go over three personality types that I think could define a corporate campaigner. Obviously these are just some ideas, you could do other things as well. I have heard a lot of people talking about a good cop and bad cop dynamic and maybe some of it could also be implemented into this, but I also think this is a bit of an maybe outdated way of thinking about it. Um, I would at least argue that it's not maybe the best way to do it, but um, let's see where we go. I introduce the poker player and uh, the unappointed CSI director and the diehard friendly activist. Um, so first a question, is it, how many in here have played poker ever in their life? Okay, so the majority, that's good. Um, so if you're playing poker, poker in general, is it scary when your opponent goes all in? Who thinks that it's scary? Raise of hands. And uh, of course, this is uh, just a trick question because the answer is it really depends. Uh, it depends on how much chips do you have yourself, how much chips, how many chips are in the middle, um, what kind of hand are you holding yourself. If you hold a really strong hand, maybe you're happy that your opponent went all in. Uh, what kind of image do you have? What kind of image does your opponent have? But instead of just standing here and explaining it all, I would like to see if we could have a volunteer to have a game uh, in front of the audience so we can uh, show it uh, while doing it. So any volunteers? Okay, wow, quite a few. Um, there's like a, a handsome young man in the front row, so I would like to invite him on the stage. <laughs> and um, I will walk around and uh, get over to him. <laughs> oh yeah. Maybe I should also bring some glasses. This is not prepared in any way. <laughs> Even though, uh, can you introduce yourself? So uh, I am uh, I am on the other side of the table. I would say, in general. Okay. <laughs> and and also it's Anna's who is my uh, co-worker. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but we will start out by a scenario one, and I hope everyone, if you don't, if you can't see exactly what's going on here, it's more or less the same that you can see on the screen. Uh, but we will just try to make it a bit more interactive. So, in this first scenario, um, tell us a little bit about yourself, Anas. Who are you this time? Well, I am a uh, small uh, fashion store. I sell a little bit of fur, but it's not the main part of the uh, of the collection I have. And, and how invested are you in, in selling for how important is it for you as a business owner? I would say it's a relatively minor part of the business, but uh, the customers sort of like it, so. Okay, and for that reason, because it's just a small part, then there's only like one coin in the middle, so he might not be that interested in defending it. And I'm just a dedicated activist, I'm a one-person guy in this uh, scenario, and he's just a small business owner. And it's not so important, I hold ace-jack, which is a pretty good hand, and he ho holds uh, 
pair of eights, which is also a pretty good hand. Um, so, but in this scenario, I will I will tell you, Anas, uh, that uh, I think your business should stop selling fur because the animals are suffering very heavily, and I can show you all this blah blah blah. Um, so now I showed him all the images, and I explained to him that a lot of customers they don't like that, and if he wants to skip selling fur. I will actually say something nice about his business uh, to the people that I know. But if you won't do it, I will probably go and protest in front of his store because I'm such a dedicated activist that I have no life apart from activism. So I can do it maybe five days a week, two or three hours a day and scare some customers away. And and from that, I will say I'm, I'm going all in with this campaign, unless, of course, we can make a deal. So I don't know how you feel about that. It seems like a good deal. So, so basically, in this first scenario, it's pretty easy because he's not so invested. But, but now we can imagine if we open the box here, and um, maybe Anas is not anymore just uh, like a small store; it's like a whole chain store of uh, you know hundreds, hundreds of uh, things. But what makes it even more difficult in this scenario is now he's probably more invested in. Uh, in selling fur because he's making quite a lot of money and maybe in some of his markets people don't care too much about animal welfare because they never heard about it. So now I'm going all in and I want you to stop selling fur and, and how do you feel about it? I, I don't think I'm going to stop selling fur. Uh, I'm not very impressed by the, um, you know, your campaign and it seems to be, you know, my fur is like high, uh, high welfare fur. Yeah. So it, it changed the dynamics a bit. So, so this is the part about what kind of strength do each of the players have. And, uh, and now I'm becoming like a small fish and he's coming a, becoming a big player. Now we want to just change the scenario a little bit. Uh, so can you introduce yourself now, Anas? Uh, yes, I am a premium first store. I, uh, like my whole family business, uh, like has been built up around selling fur, lots of fur. It's premium quality, customers love it, high brand. Okay, but because it's just a single store, then he doesn't have that many chips. So he has maybe this one as well, but there will be a lot in the middle. And the reason why is because basically his whole business depends on selling fur. So if I if I go all in with the 10 chips that I have into this part, what do you do? I will match you. Yeah. So, I mean, he's, he's not scared. I'm, I'm not scaring him at all. So basically, you could say that I'm asking for too much because I will have to, you know, protest in front of his store until all customers leave. Otherwise, he will he will defend it to his death. Um, we'll move on. So now we're at scenario three. And uh, introduce yourself, please. I am a uh, retailer. Uh, I uh, have a bunch of supermarket chains, and I sell a little bit of foie gras. It's not I'm not a foie gras supermarket, but I do sell foie gras. Yeah. Okay, so since he's a retailer, he has a lot of chips because, you know, they make a lot of money. Um, and, I mean, these are 50 chips, so it's like, it's ki kind of a big deal, but not an extremely big deal because, I mean, how many people buy foie gras when you're outside of France? Um, but I will go all in with my uh, 10 chips, and uh, how do you feel about it? I'm not too scared about your campaign. Mm -hmm. I think I will, uh, I will match you on that one. So, so now I have to do something else because I can't beat a retailer on my own because I'm just a single activist. So I will form an organization and will be like a whole campaign doing this. So suddenly I have, let's say, a stack of tens. And now I can kind of, you know, do some damage to his stack. And uh, I will still ask you to stop selling foie gras. And how do you feel now that we have this big campaign and I showed you all the images and I will show it also to the customers on social media and maybe get the media involved as well? I think I need some more information about this uh, foie gras stuff and uh, maybe we can uh, reschedule a meeting in three months. Sometimes this is the best you can get because you have to be patient. You can't win it in, you know, one scare thing. But but this is, uh, we're making progress. Okay. Now we will make it a little bit more complicated. We made it a bit simple. So we'll get into um, something called the ECC and the BCC. Uh, it's uh, for broiler people. Okay, how many are familiar with the European Chicken Commitment? Show of hands. Okay, because otherwise I would spend 30 minutes explaining it. But we'll just... Uh, know that this is something that is better for chickens, but while it's not perfect, right? Um, so, in this scenario, 
Anas, he still has a lot of chips, maybe even more because like he's a really big retailer. And now we are like even, he's so rich. Um, but also because what we're asking is quite a lot and everyone who worked with broiler issues know that this is a big ask. It's not just asking to remove a little bit of foie gras. So that's a lot in the middle. Um, so, but at least I'm still an organization and I put a decent amount of uh, resources into this. So it's basically the foie gras scenario again, but there's more in the middle because we are playing for higher stakes. Um, so we'll go all in on Anas and say, I really think you should commit to the ECC. How do you feel about it? I think uh, it's good that you try to educate the customers, but um, you know, I'm going to match you on uh, that one, I think. So basically this, this is also known as a, a snap call. Like it's, it's too easy for him because he's pot committed. I'm not really threatening anything. Um, so basically maybe what he's feeling like is a bit like this. Just come on, give it, give it all to me. So I'll just let Anna sit and I will go back behind the screen again. Um, and so what you saw was just some really simple way of how to think about it. And, and I hope it's clear that there are certain things we can do if we want to win this game while playing poker. So the higher my stake is, the more chips I have, the more scary I become to Anas and he wants to, to fold and he doesn't want to take. And, and, and that is translated into having a stronger organization, having more funds, having a better track record, having, having strong media skills. All these kind of things add to your stack and that makes you able to actually win in the negotiation table. If, if you don't have all these things and you're asking for a lot, you will probably not win anything. The other thing you can do if you don't have like a very strong organization, you can pick easier campaigns. So then maybe you shouldn't take the ECC campaign, you should take the Fogra campaign because then there will be fewer chips on the table or you should find another way towards ECC to see if you can get it you know, one step at a time and ask for smaller things until you get the whole thing. Uh, another thing we didn't talk so much about right now is your image. Um, so in, in poker you have like this, the image of a very loose player, that's the kind of person who goes all in on all the time. That would be translated in, in campaigning to like you just pick new topics every week and you pick new uh, companies every week. And if the companies, they sense that they will not be so scared when you say I'm going to launch a campaign because they know, well, Maybe that's going to last for a week or two weeks and uh, then you will do something else. So we have to maintain a very tight image of being someone who goes all the way when necessary. Uh, otherwise, we will not have the respect from the other player. Mm. And then obviously there's the hand strength, like what kind of hand do you hold? And that could be, I mean, this is not a perfect analogy, but it could be translated into how good are you at communicating what you want? Uh, how good are you at making creative campaigns? So they actually know that if you want to do something, you can do it in a, in a very good way. Um, so when, when to actually bluff? So normally I would say reduce your bluffing, but if you have a really tight image and if the company shows weakness, like if Anna's in the sense was like, please don't do a campaign. Sometimes you will hear companies say that, that, that means that you have a higher chance of winning when, when doing bluffing. Although I would, I would rarely bluff, to be honest. Uh, you also need to have a playable hand if you want to semi-bluff, because if you just do a cold bluff and you're not going to follow up with anything, you're going to look extremely weak. So sometimes at least doing a short campaign will make it more credible the, the way that you actually try to do it. Um, and also if the pot is small enough, so you could see in the first instance when he was just a single fashion retailer, uh, fashion store, then he would be more likely to fold the bluff, whereas if it's a big part of his uh, business, then, uh, then, then he probably would have to fight it. Uh, but also keep in mind that once you start bluffing and people find out, you will kind of lose your image for a long time. It takes a long time to build a solid image and it doesn't take a long time to lose it again. It's a bit like working out or something. Um, so I think we will start playing poker. So please uh, give a round of applause to Anas for <laughs> taking this hard bet. And then we will go to what we could call a cooperative game of... Uh, I call it the unappointed CSR director. So like CSR director is just like, you know, sustainability kind of guy in the company who advises on corporate policies and, and these kind of things. And, and that's also the personality of the, the friendly but diehard activist who really wants to win this campaign. Um, but before getting into this, I would have this disclaimer because I think it's fun to gamify this work, but 
I think it's also just a metaphor because it's a way of explaining how you can think about it. And I think it's useful to some extent, but I wouldn't encourage people to get too obsessed with playing games all the time. We know it from personal relationships. If, if you meet people who play games, you get, you get tired of them and you just stop trusting them and everything. And the same goes if you want to work in this field for a long time. If, if people just sense that you are ready to say anything to get anything, I don't think you will be as successful as if you become, you could say, more sincere and more authentic in your approach. And that is, that's, that's, I think, what I'm trying to do the best that I can. It's not always successful uh, and it's hard to do it maybe 100%, but I think you can do it going a long way and just being as truthy truth-seeking and sincere as you can when, when dealing with companies. Of course, it depends what kind of company, because you will also meet people who play games. And if you're meeting people who are playing games, then you might find yourself having to play some games once in a while. But I would discourage doing it too much, at least. Um, so if we look at the CSR director, I have this image. Like It's the guy who whispers in the king's ear and says, we, we should do this, sire. This is a very good idea. And, uh, and then the decision maker will, will see if he listens to this guy. Um, so when we are playing the game in uh, brackets um, about the director of CSR, our ability is to be good at putting ourselves in the shoes of the company. So it's not just about what we want and how to you know, make them feel guilty for not doing what we want. It's like really understanding their business, understanding what's hard for them, what's easy for them, what situation they are in also aside from your own uh, issue. Uh, but having said that, it's also about establishing your issue as being important. I mean, sometimes it, it's easy if it's like an old issue that has been around, you know, for tens of years and you can just jump into that. But sometimes you also have to open up a new issue that could be broilers or that could be fish welfare, that could be other things. And, and that's where you have to stand strong and, and try to make it on their radar to take it seriously. Also, when you're playing this game, you can't like just go all in all the time as we did in the poker scenario, because you have to be very patient at times if you have a very big ask and you have to be quite constructive in seeing how you can make it work for, for the company also. And then you look for common ground and, and you push for the, pro for the progress that you can. Um, I want to say that there are like some pitfalls when doing this kind of work. So on one end, you can be like this uh, hard seller and you're just like, yeah, this is great and the whole world is changing and you can be part of it and it's going to be cheap for you. And that runs a risk of being demoted to the pushy salesman, the guy you can see on the right side, I believe. Um, and it's, it's not really good because once they find out that you're just saying things to win and not because it's true, then they will not trust you more. Um, and, and it's a hard time to get from the pushy salesman and getting back to being the, the CSR director. On the other end of the scale, you can also become too agreeable. So whenever you meet with companies, they will tell you all kinds of things like, oh, this is very expensive, this is very hard, and uh, uh, so many things are going on in society, and the customers are not ready, and the economy. And while a lot of those things can actually be true, you can always just be lured into something being like, yeah, okay, yeah, I can understand that. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Okay, let's meet again in half a year's time and discuss it again. And then basically you've been overtaken by this company and, and you're working more for them than for your cause. So there is this sweet spot between agreeing on what you can agree on and pushing for what you can push for. And sometimes that sweet spot can be quite wide and sometimes it's a little bit narrow, uh, depending on the topic, depending on the company, depending on like your own organization and all these kinds of uh, metrics. Um, but it's not always that you succeed becoming this CSR director, you know, in some countries or in some topics, it can be much easier because you manage to put the agenda on everyone's radar and they're like interested and then they want to listen. But other times like they're just like, well, that's fine. We don't want to do it. We don't even want to meet with you. Um, and then if you're not making progress doing this, then you might have to resolve to what I call the die-hard friendly activist. And this is, you know, some people would call it like the bad cop. Like if you can't win by, you know, being nice and agreeable and friendly, then you have to become really badass. But I would also just warn against, you don't have to be that badass because you can just state things that what you're going to do in a very transparent fashion and just say, well, what we will have to do then, if you're not going to do what we think you should do, we will have to start a campaign and we will have to do this and that. And you can actually like do it in a more friendly way. Just like if you, you know, 
go to the gym and there's like a really strong person, the person doesn't have to say, I can bench like 150 kilos or something. You can see it. Uh, so you don't have to appear stronger than you are, I would argue, um, because the strength also comes from the way you actually portray the whole thing. Uh, so I think the bad comp can be quite friendly still, and, and that can also make it easier for you to get back into a good setting. So you can be, you know, saying things that are not so nice for them, but they will respect you because you say it in a, you know, compassionate way, in, in lack of better terms. So some of the tips is, uh, you know, stay cool and friendly. Um, just like I said before, you know, small dogs, they bark and the big dogs, they don't have to. Um, be as pa patient as you can. And the reason for that is, I mean, once you've tried doing a few campaigns, like in the beginning, it might be extremely exciting. And like now we are really pushing for campaigns. And yeah, this feels good because we're finally doing what we're meant to be doing. But then after a while, you're like, wow, this is draining. Like you're putting in a lot of resources into this. And sometimes you can't even make the campaign as good as you thought it would be. And, you know, social media is getting worse and the media, like, they're always stupid and all these kind of things. So as long as you can, you know, refrain from actually pushing the button, I would advise to do it because it will save you a lot of resources. But obviously, sometimes you really have to go for it and, and then be as good as you can. Um, but I think the whole point of being this diehard friendly activist is if you can get back into the other chair, being among the people in the company and actually advise them once again, you would like to do that because it's simply more effective as long as uh, you're not being too agreeable, obviously. Um, so also some words of caution. When you are negotiating with companies, don't push too hard and ask those simple questions like, can't you see that you just have to do it? Or like, when are you going to do it? Uh, because you have to always sense, like everyone who's tried some selling or just convincing people about going to some event, like if you just ask straight away and you know the person is a little bit on the fence, you will most likely get a no. But if you like spend some time explaining how great it is and you can see that they're getting interested, well, I mean, then it's easier to, you know, close the deal as they say in selling. Um, I put it in uh, poker terms also a little bit uh, with, with, with that thing and just consider the difference between saying would your company commit to the ECC and by what timeline please and it's like well I'm not really interested and it's uh, portrayed here so you put in $100 versus if you say something along the lines of your competitor has already published a commitment and the media and the public have a high interest in the subject uh, and you know the chickens that can't walk normally and we will soon publish a ranking about your companies and we want to know where you're currently sta standing in, in this uh, position. So the, the thing is here, you might not even have to ask that directly, are you going to do it or not? Because you're asking other questions that will lead them to think, hey, maybe we should do this. Um, and, and then you're adding more leverage and more pressure. Uh, but that obviously also requires more work because you need to build a reputation. You need to show some results in your campaign. And it's always hardest in the beginning when you have no results. So you have to find out who you can actually make alliances with. And then, I mean, at the end of the day, you can't win all the time just by talking and talking. Uh, so sometimes you have to go all in. And when you do that, you have to get creative and you have to, you know, either make fun or provocative uh, campaigns. Put in one example here from one of our broiler campaigns where we put a reward of half a million kroner, which is 50, 60, 70,000 euros, I believe, um, for showing how the chickens actually live and uh, giving us free access to the barn. And even though we didn't get any uh, bidders actually we were quite close in one country when we did it but even though we didn't do it we got a lot of attention and a lot of pressure on the companies because they didn't want to show it and you know some of the farmers that did some kind of live stream that also gave some attention so this was just one way of making it creative and it was you could say a cheaper way because we had to buy some advertising but we also got a lot of you know free media included uh, you always have to look for those ways where you can kind of multiply your your resources when you when you want to do a campaign um, and then you just enjoy the feeling when your opponent eventually falls in this so a quick sum up um, I would argue for reduced bluffing even though I know some people they they love bluffing and I mean it's certainly effective at times but once you're being caught in the bluff it can be really painful um, and I would argue that you should try at least with the difficult campaigns where you know they're gonna last for years and if you don't know they're gonna last for years maybe that was also a mistake in in the beginning uh, but you should try to establish a better like long-term relationship with the company so they actually get to know you also the companies you're working with today you might work with them again in one or two years time with a different topic so if you write really 
piss them all off, then uh, you're also having a problem when you come around next time. Um, yeah, increase your stack size, we talked about it, and, and go all in. I think I probably managed to do it faster than expected, but uh, thank you so much for listening. Great, thanks, thanks a lot, Toby, for a nice lecture and interesting prompts involved. Uh, so uh, we have uh, two questions uh, for now. Uh, could you give a more detailed example of a successful bluff from your time at Anima International, or an unsuccessful one would be similarly entertaining, perhaps? Mm, okay, okay. I don't uh, do bluffs unsuccessfully, but. <laughs> <laughs> I think an example of bluffing, and I would call it more like semi-bluffing, that's like in a situation it could be like a fur campaign where you have a list of, you know, 20, 30, 40 companies that you want to convince, and you might do a little bit of a general approach. You like you contact them, you don't have time to meet with all of them, so you do it more like on email basis, and you make them know that, I mean, unless you do this or that, it could also be for Grada, would be a good example with restaurants. Unless you do it, you might be a target for a campaign, and actually, they might not be the biggest target, but they would feel like they were like in the middle of it. So it's like, giving them more attention that you probably would eventually. That would be an example of a semi-bluff. Um, I'm trying to think if I can think of an unsuccessful bluff. But I mean, I'm, I'm sure we've tried that over the years, like doing this kind of things. And then the thing is, if you don't have a connection with the company, if, if they're not replying to you, then you can say all kinds of things and it will just ignore you. And then you're like, in a sense, your bluff was called because they didn't show you any respect or anything, and then you have have to decide whether or not you want to like run this campaign or if you just want to be like, okay, I'll, I'll move on. So I'm sure we haven't followed through in some examples where we're like contacting a lot of companies and then we said something and, and we didn't follow up. So yeah. Mm, okay. Okay. Uh, next question is about. Um, cases when the public uh, outrage or public involvement is not as high as for some high profile issues such as first what would you uh, be your advice and uh, suggested approach for groups working on issues where it's harder to get big public outreach examples group working on fish or other aquatic animals. It seems in those topics the company will feel less risk and reputation damage since most people won't care too much about fish welfare. Is there a way to move corporates without putting a public pressure on them through campaigning? I mean, one way obviously would be to ask for less, but I don't know if that's like really motivating. So if you ask for less, they can do it. And if you find like this kind of win-win where it helps the animals, but it's not too expensive, to me, that's a little bit of a boring way to play it, but that might sometimes be the right way because I think there can be a tendency in the movement to move on to new topics all the time. And I think even moving from, say, cage-free to broiler was a big move, and I don't think everyone realized how big that was. And then if you want to move on to, to fish straight away before solving the other things, that could be, I would say, dangerous in the sense that we might run into you know, losing too many campaigns and not winning enough. But I mean, if you were to get the public involved, I mean, you would have to find out what is actually the topic within fish welfare that people would be upset about. Because I bet you that if you took a focus group of people or you showed some things, they would probably not be okay with what's going on. But the thing is, just because people's values might be aligned with us, they also have to be externally about it, like external about it, because you can always show some surveys and saying, well, we asked the public and 85% agree that fish shouldn't feel pain when they're being killed or whatever. But the company would be like, yeah, but I mean, they buy fish all the time and, and this is how it is. So it's, this is also the thing about the pushy salesman. You can say something that sounds right, but if it's not really true, you also have to kind of admit that because otherwise you're losing your bargaining power at, at the table. So it's, I mean, it's, I don't think this is the best reply to this, but it's just understanding that it's a little bit difficult with these things and that's not really an easy fix. I think one of the fixes is if we are to be hugely successful with fish welfare campaigns, we have to increase our stack size. So we have to like go really, really big. Otherwise, we can't expect really big results.
Mm, okay, okay. And that's, it's a spontaneous follow-up from me, but how would you feel about like putting another pressure area in, in such a case, for instance, if you knew that the company that's uh, producing fish also is abusing their employees or like using a different area to put pressure to gain something in the area that you're more interested in? Perhaps you're also interested in good treatment of employees, but maybe mm -hmm, mm -hmm. would that be an option? I think it's a very interesting question. I think it's really hard to answer because, I mean, there might be issues where you could be successful about pointing on other things, but I think it also runs the risk of straying away from our own topic and, and losing some credibility by getting into other issues. So normally I wouldn't do it, but having said that, we also do it sometimes, like, for instance, just pointing that your competitors are doing, I mean, in a sense, that's a bad argument. It's like when you're a child and say, all the others, they can go out at night and I can't do it. And I mean, that, that's not an argument. That's just pointing to some obvious things. So I, I just think you have to be really careful when diving into other topics because also you are kind of, you know, trying to encompass too much. Um, and especially if it's topics where it's not totally settled, where there might be differences of, of opinions, because that can also create some, you know, challenges internally if not everyone agrees with uh, this particular topic. Um, so, so I would normally refrain from doing it, but I can totally get why it's good and maybe when you should do it it should be if you could find another like actor of actually stating it so if you know that something bad is happening in another area maybe you would rather tip off some other people to do it rather than being the sender of that message yourself i think that would normally be a good way to do it mm, okay okay um, a lot of uh, people want to hear kirsty's question what should you do if you go all in on a big campaign but don't win yeah, yeah. You should uh, you should buy rebuy more chips and uh, <laughs> keep pushing. Um, I mean, there is a time where you have to just you know admit failure. I mean, some sometimes you 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 took the wrong bet and and you shouldn't have done it and and you underrated uh, your opponent. Um, or sometimes it was okay to lose because you wanted to just say something and you got attention on it and you put pressure on other targets than the one that you were after. So sometimes there's an idea of just, you know, pushing one big company, you know that they are likely not going to do it, but because you have that ongoing pressure, you can talk to other companies and get them on board until you eventually get the big fish. Uh, so that could be one thing. But, but normally you have to do that with open eyes before doing it and not like making rationalizations afterwards and saying, well, actually that was the plan. Um, but otherwise you should be ready to, to, to keep pushing but that can also be burnout i think there have been campaigns in the past where a lot of people joined forces and they failed and that can be very taxing on people's motivations and you can't make wrong calls too often because people will stray off to other topics and and lose motivation mm, okay so the next question lines up well with this how do you know when to stop exit campaign I, I never know, to be honest. But I mean, often you have a you have a feeling like you have a feeling like how how is your campaign doing? Do you get a lot of responses, or are you just you know pushing, pushing, and seeing nothing happening? At least you should see some changes happening in either the way it's being perceived by your own audience, how you can get media interested. I, I think unfortunately, media is extremely important when doing campaigns. Like everybody is looking at it, and companies feel so pressured when you can get that. But sometimes it's really hard to get media's attention. They want to, you know, report on all kinds of crazy things and, and not exactly your topic. Um, so if you find yourself in a situation where no matter what you do, nothing is happening, that might be a time for either stopping or, you know, finding some help for, like, how to make it to the next level. And I think this is something we are some, sometimes facing in, in our movement. It's like, if we don't win in the first year or two years, how do you actually make your campaign interesting and relevant uh, because I mean if people have tried working with say for gra campaigns it's you know in many countries it's kind of an easy win because it's a, a small product and it's very horrible what's going on it's very easy for everyone to understand so often you can win within days or weeks or months but what happens when you have to do it after two three four five years are we good enough at like wave four and wave five and wave six I, I tend to think that we are not good enough, and this is something we should all work on together, finding out how we can improve our campaigning uh, skills. Um, yeah, that was a long answer. Yeah, there's some sunken cost fallacy involved for sure. Mm -hmm. Hard to 
to, to get out of uh, an involvement. Okay, the next question, uh, what are some of the most effective campaign tactics you've used or seen, seen used? I mean, obviously, investigations have proven to be very effective. We can see very often when investigations are being released, the media is interested and a lot of pressure is being used. Um, I don't know if that's like doable all the time and, and like how many investigations can you do before it's, it becomes the same. Uh, I think that's one of the, the difficult questions, but obviously they, they, they can be very, very good. Um, and I think, you know, going directly after one company, a very big company, it, it usually has a big effect. If you don't do it all the time, at least the first time, it's kind of surprising. Oh, this good company, how can they be so bad? Uh, and, and a lot of organizations and it's like also all around society, it's kind of I wouldn't say taboo, but it's like a, a big move to actually criticize someone in public. Uh, so whenever you can do that, that's that's useful. But that's it refers back to what I said before. What do you do after you've had those first strike and second strike that is like, you know, you can determine the success quite easily and, 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 and how do we follow up from there? I, I think that's where we are right now in, in many respects. How, how do we go from there? Okay, so I think there's time for one more at least. How to deal with a situation where you agreed on too much and the company agreed, agreed on too little? How to switch back to a more mutually profitable deal when you already let go of too much according to you? Yeah, that's the thing. Like, you shouldn't take too much off the table if you're not happy with it. <laughs> so, so um, But it is hard if, if you are having a long campaign and you can see that, you know, things are being taken off the table and you're like in a way desperate to get some kind of result and they're also kind of desperate to just find and like when does it become loose loose in a sense like like and, and you should know that before getting into this like what is my ultimate thing but the thing is a lot of people especially if they're not like too experienced with this if they know okay the ultimate deadline we can accept is this and the lowest uh, thing we can accept is this and then if you go to the table and say basically uh, the last deadline is this and, uh, and and then what is your negotiation power and this is where you know it becomes a little bit of a game even though i said you shouldn't play too many games but i mean I think it's just normal if you want to buy something uh, secondhand online, you don't put your, your last number, like you put something that you're willing to give, but you're also ready to give a bit more. And, and I think that's also just normal if you go to a company, like if, it's really hard if you can negotiate anything. So you have to have something to negotiate with. And maybe that would be also like how much campaigning are you going to do or like timelines or everything. But, but I mean, you should never get in that situation where like you're both losing because then yeah, you're going to regret it. Mm, okay, uh, so maybe the final one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to finish it, but in countries where we talk to companies about different topics, ECC, Cage Free, would you rather have one person talking to the company or two separate ones, each for one campaign, and why? How would you navigate different campaign needs? Company is reporting Cage Free progress but doesn't want to sign ECC. I think that's a really difficult question. Uh, so when we started in, in Denmark and Norway with the broiler campaign, we had more or less won the cage free campaign and i think if we hadn't it would probably have been premature to get on with the broiler campaign i think it's possible to do several campaigns at the same time but maybe you know a very big campaign and a medium sized campaign as i would call the cage free might not be a good mix so in that case it like to respond directly to the question, it might be better that it was two different organizations, but I would also be very aware that the one trying to get broilers on board would suffer a little bit. Maybe in a sense you could use the broiler as a leverage to get the cage free sorted. So that's when we talk about, you know, taking things off the table and say, okay, if you can't do the ECC now, then at least you should do the cage free now. And then we can talk ECC in one or two years time. Maybe that's when you can actually use it as some kind of negotiation tool. Um, but I think it's a little bit like sometimes we take our mouth to full, as we say in a Danish expression, at least like we, we try to do too much, too few people, and we should be very aware of this. And that's also what some of the examples illustrate that even when we are small NGO, I would put often that we only have a hundred chips into, you know, 500 or 1,000. And, and maybe as organizations, we shouldn't focus on five different campaigns as we often do. Maybe we should just focus on one or two and, and then really go all in and make sure that we win it big time and then we can move on to something else. I think that would solve some problems, but I realize that there are other issues with, with, with that. So it's, it might, might not be the perfect uh, solution. Great, thank you for the lecture.
Thank you.